<clears throat> All right, well, let's, um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and open the topic by reading uh, a majority of Romans chapter 9. Uh, you know, when, uh, when I was younger, I was in, you know, broad evangelical churches. I was trained to look at the Bible in a particular way, basically the way that I described before, which is, um, you know, uh, thinking that salvation was essentially in my hands. You know, God's made the offer. I can choose to receive Him or not receive Him any time I want. And with that kind of belief, I pretty much put him in my back pocket, my sinner's prayer, you know, in my back pocket, and thought, well, when I'm really in need, then I'll pull it out and, and I'll pray. Well, thankfully, uh, the Lord showed me my need earlier on, and I, I, I prayed, and, um, and the Lord had mercy on me. Um, but during those days, whenever I would read this chapter, it never made sense to me. It, it seemed so clear in this passage that God is the one who chooses and, and it's not really me and that he made this choice a long time ago and he doesn't choose everyone and I just couldn't make any sense out of this, this uh, chapter uh, because of my belief system. But then I listened to R.C. Sproul's Chosen by God. Somebody basically recommended that I, I listened to it and I did and I didn't agree with it the first time, second time I listened to it, uh, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Third time I was convinced. And after that, I began to see God's choosing everywhere in Scripture. It's just that I thought I could explain those things away, but I couldn't explain Romans 9, which is the reason why I'm going to read this passage this morning, because this tells us quite plainly that God is the one who chooses from a mass of fallen humanity to have mercy on some, but not on others. And the only reason why you and I are here and we love the Lord and are worshiping Him this morning is because of His grace and not because we saw our need and chose Him. All right, uh, let me, let me read. Uh, Romans 9, beginning in verse 1. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. And by the way, notice Paul says something here that expresses a great depth of love for the Jewish people. He said that, that he would be willing to be damned if they could be saved. I don't know how many of us would say we have that kind of desire for the salvation of, of anyone, but it just shows the great love that Paul had for them. The problem is the majority of Israel did not receive their Messiah. And now the question is, how can God's promise be true if basically he sent his Messiah, but they didn't receive him? Well, he goes on to explain it. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. In other words, you know, not everyone in the physical offspring of Abraham are necessarily going to be those that are the Israel that God is referring to, that he's going to save. Okay? That is a specific group within the nation of Israel. Okay? Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh, who are children of God, the natural offspring. But the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to His choice would stand, not because of works, not because of what they do, 
But because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very reason I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. What does that mean? Well, it means just what it says. And that's kind of the difficult pill to swallow. God is absolutely sovereign. Now, let me just finish this. Um, oh, wait a minute. That was where I wanted to conclude, wasn't it? Okay. I could read the rest of this chapter, but we really don't have time. And again, let me apologize in advance for the, the headiness, perhaps, of, of this um, sermon, and also a, a bit on its length, because it's a little bit longer than normal. Well, let me, let me begin by saying that a few weeks ago, we were considering the fundamentals, okay, those crucial, critical teachings of the Bible that are necessary for a biblical gospel. These are the things you must believe to be a Christian. And if you do believe them, and you show basically the evidence of a transformed life, that is that you really are trusting in Jesus, then you should be received as a Christian. Okay? That's how we basically are to view people if they're trusting in the true gospel and they show that they are, then we should look at them as Christians. So that's kind of where we boil the Bible down to those essential points. But we also saw that that doesn't mean that the rest of the Bible, the rest of what God has to say, doesn't matter. Dr. Godfrey, uh, Bob Godfrey, who's go doing the church history series, who was, again, the president of Westminster Seminary and professor of church history for several decades, uh, says in his lectures on the modern church, which we may see in the future if the Lord wills, he tells us that evangelicalism today, that is most churches, most Christians, have boiled Christianity down to what it sees as the very few essential points. And he says there's really only four. I'm not going to basically mention what those are. But they do this in the hopes of uniting the church. You know, let's not get so picky about what you believe, what I believe. We believe the things that are most important, so that's all that really matters. Now, we would agree that there are situations when the church needs to set its differences aside, such as when we need to close ranks against common enemies that threaten all of us, like, you know, theistic, well, theistic evolution, atheistic evolutionism, the beliefs of the cults, okay? And some would argue, and I think they're probably right, that there are times when we should even set aside, we might even say the fundamentals, to close ranks even with Rome or with the Mormons on such matters as abortion and homosexuality because we all agree that those things are moral evils so we can unite against certain enemies. But apart from situations like this, we need to understand we should never feel free to set aside anything that God teaches us in His Word because everything He says is important. All of it is for our well-being. R.C. Sproul reminded us this past Wednesday evening that if we would have a righteous relationship with God, and that means a right one, you know, we're doing things right, and have a right relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and have a right relationship with the world, we have to believe and submit to everything God says in the Bible. Now, I want to emphasize this because what we're looking at, you know, today and next week you know, Godfrey this evening is going to give us a glimpse into a controversy 
that split the Dutch Reformed Church in the 17th century when the followers of Jacobus Arminius, who was a professor of theology at Leiden University, submitted, now the followers, Arminius was dead by this time, but his followers submitted a document to the government called the Remonstrance, asking for the freedom to teach five things that were against the beliefs of the Reformed churches. Now, these are the five teachings of the Synod of Dort, the, the five teachings the Synod of Dort will later rebut or refute, and, you know, uh, which will come to be known, or I should say, uh, uh, called the five points of Calvinism. By the way, uh, Godfrey is going to emphasize when he deals with this that this does not summarize what John Calvin believed. This does not summarize what the Reformed churches believe. These are just five uh, Reformed answers to five Arminian objections. So what I'd like to do uh, this morning, what I'd like to begin this morning, is an examination of those five points of the Remonstrance. Not only uh, to understand what they teach, uh, since these points are, as I've said before, are widely held by a majority of churches today, but also why it's important that we believe and embrace the five counterpoints of the synod. Now, again, only because they're biblical, but uh, that we need to embrace those. It's important to our relationship with God. It's important to have a right relationship with Him, to give Him the glory that belongs to Him. So today, I want us to consider their view, that is the remonstrance view, on human depravity. I mean, just how bad are we after the fall? And God's election, His choice, and contrast that with what the Bible says. And, and next Lord's Day, we'll conclude with their views on the atonement, the Spirit's work in bringing us to Christ, and on perseverance. We are going to touch probably on uh, some of these things as well this morning. Now, let's begin with their view on human depravity. This, this isn't where they began, but I think it'll help us to start here because once we see what the Bible has to say about our condition after the fall, we'll understand, I think, more clearly why the, basically the, um, the counterpoints, I'm just going to call them you know, the, the, the five points of Calvinism, why those things must follow. Now, the one thing I think most people don't understand is that these remonstrant Arminians actually agreed with the Reformed Church on man's condition after the fall, on what he is like. Now, listen to what they write in Article 3. I'll try to read it as, as in a way that we can all follow. Okay that man has not saving grace of himself, nor of the energy of his free will, inasmuch as he, in the state of apostasy and sin, can of and by himself neither think, will, nor do anything that is truly good, such as having faith eminently is but that it is needful that he be born again of God in Christ through his Holy Spirit and renewed in understanding, inclination, or will, and all his powers, in order that he may rightly understand, think, will, and effect what is truly good according to the word of Christ, John 15, verse 5, apart from me you can do nothing. And by the way, it, I mean, this almost sounds like somebody who's reformed could have written this because we agree with this, don't we? Now, this is not what we typically think of or understand as the Arminian view, at least the view of the majority of churches today. Most evangelical Christians today see man, see us, as not quite totally depraved, that we haven't lost all of our moral ability. We haven't lost all of our love for what is good. We're, we're dangerously sick. We have very little strength, but we still have enough to reach out in faith 
and to take hold of Christ as he is offered to us in the gospel. Now, that's the, the belief of a majority of churches today. Now, the remonstrants didn't believe that. They believed that apart from the grace of God, we can do nothing good. We can't even believe in Christ, which they said would be truly good. We must first be born again of God in Christ through His Holy Spirit. Now, they explain this a little bit further in Article 4, which we're going to read uh, or look at a little bit more fully next week. Listen what they say. That this grace of God is the beginning, continuance, and accomplishment of all good, even to this extent that the regenerate man himself, without prevenient or assisting, awakening, following, and cooperative, uh, cooperative grace, can neither think, will, nor do good, nor withstand any temptation to evil, so that all good deeds or movements that can be conceived must be ascribed to the grace of God in Christ. So their two main points are, we're dead in sin. And we can't do anything good. We need the Spirit. That's the only way we will ever do any good. By the way, as I said before, this is what John Wesley held. John Wesley, I hope everybody's familiar with John Wesley. He was a great evangelist. He lived during the time of George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. And many people came to faith in Christ through him. Well, he had a very high regard for Arminius. He believed that everyone is depraved as they come into the world. So they cannot trust savingly in Christ. So now, how can anyone then come to faith with a view like this? Well, this is the second point. God has chosen to give everyone prevenient grace, a grace that comes before faith, a grace that basically makes you alive enough to be able to choose Him. Now, this help of the Holy Spirit does not save you by itself, but it enables you to believe so that you may make a choice one way or the other for Christ or against Him. Now, there are going to be some who do choose Him and some who don't choose Him. Those who choose Him and persevere to the end will live, and those who choose not to, to receive Him will eventually perish. Okay, now that's the view of, of the remonstrance. We're, we're dead, but God gives to everyone His Holy Spirit to enable us to believe. Now, what do we believe? Well, we agree that we are totally depraved. As I said, you know, no, really no Calvinist could write a better statement of total depravity than what the remonstrance wrote, okay? We are totally depraved, and so we cannot, because we don't want to, receive the Lord Jesus Christ apart from God's grace. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now think of the word dead, okay? Because what Paul means here is not just that you were weak and sick and barely able but still able to reach out to Christ. You were absolutely dead. Dead doesn't mean barely alive. Dead means to be completely void of life. And in this case, he's referring to the spiritual life, the, the moral life, the kind of life that we need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to want to receive Him as our Lord and our Savior. Now, Paul says that while we are in this condition, we hated God, the true God. And because we hated him, we could not please him. Just think about what I read earlier. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, The mind set on the flesh, and again, those who don't have God's spirit, and not everybody does, is hostile toward God. What does that mean? It means they hate God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay? So we agree that man is dead in trespass in sin. Absolutely dead. He cannot receive the Lord Jesus Christ because that's plainly what the Bible 
says. Now, we also agree that God has to give us His Holy Spirit, therefore, before we can come to Him. Jesus said to those Jews who were following Him on one occasion, after He had fed them with the loaves and the fish, um, no one, He says in John 6, 44, no one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws Him. Now, why did Jesus say that to those Jews who were following Him? It's because He knew that they were following Him only because He fed them and only because they wanted more, okay? They wanted Him to feed them a second meal. But Jesus knew what was in their hearts, and so He encouraged Himself by saying, realizing these people were not there for Him. He said, no one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws Him. Now, that word can refers to ability. No one has the ability to come to Jesus because of what we just saw. Because by nature, as we come into the world, we actually hate Him. Now, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws Him. Okay? The Father's drawing, the word there essentially means to drag or to coerce. Now, Jesus isn't saying that the Father has to force us against our wills to come, but that He must change our hearts by His Holy Spirit so that we come to Him willingly. Okay, so we agree on these two things. We're dead, and God must give us His Holy Spirit before we will come. But the thing we disagree on is that He gives His Spirit to everyone. I mean, we already saw Paul making this distinction in Romans chapter 8 between those who have the Spirit and those who don't have the Spirit and how each of them behave. So how can you say or how can anyone say God gives to everyone His Holy Spirit? He clearly doesn't. That's what we disagree on. He only gives the Holy Spirit to those whom He has chosen. Now this brings us to our second point. God must choose whom he's going to give the Holy Spirit. Now, these remonstrants believe that God, you know, they believe that God made a choice. First of all, he chooses to give his Holy Spirit to everyone so that they can believe, as we've seen. But then he chooses those who choose him. Those he foresees will receive his Son and persevere to the end. Now, again, this is what the majority of evangelical Christians, evangelical Arminian Christians, believe today. God looks down the quarters of time. He chooses those who choose Him. Listen to what they write in their first article. This is where they actually began. That God, by an eternal, unchangeable purpose in Jesus Christ, His Son, before the foundation of the world, has determined out of the fallen, sinful race of men, to save in Christ, for Christ's sake, and through Christ, those who, through the grace of the Holy Ghost, shall believe on this His Son, Jesus, and shall persevere in this faith and obedience of faith through this grace, even to the end, and on the other hand, to leave the incorrigible and unbelieving in sin and under wrath, and to condemn them as alienate from Christ according to the word of the gospel in John 3.36. He who believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Okay. Now, again, there are things here that we can agree with and things we don't agree with. We believe that he gives the Holy Spirit to enable us to, to believe. But we don't believe that He gives the Spirit to everyone. He gives the Spirit only to the elect, to those whom He has chosen. Now, He tells us through the Apostle Paul, God does, that He chose to save some in eternity. Now, it's probably not right to call this a choice because God knows eternally what He's going to do. He doesn't really make choices. It's better to call this His eternal purpose. This is what He has always willed to do. Paul writes in Romans 8.29, For those whom He foreknew, 
He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. By the way, being uh, predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son means that He's predestined us to salvation. Those whom He foreknew, He predestined to salvation. Now again, Arminians, the, the remonstrants, believe that this passage actually proves their point. God predestines to salvation everyone he foreknows or foresees will choose his son. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, the problem with this is they're looking at it, I think they're reading into this text, as though what God foreknows is the choice they're going to make. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying not, you know, for, well, how does he put it here? For those whom he foreknew were going to choose him, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. But he says those whom he foreknew, those whom he foreknew. This word, um, you know, again, it's not what he foreknew, but whom. It's not what they do that he foreknows. It's them, okay? It's these people. And if we understand what the word foreknow means, then perhaps it'll make more sense because foreknow does not mean to know ahead of time what they're going to do, even though God certainly does foreknow everything that's going to take place. But to foreknow means to forelove or to love beforehand. Think about what uh, Moses writes in Genesis 4 in verse 1. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Now, he wasn't talking about Adam was observing his wife and learning things about her, and that caused her to conceive. But he was referring to the love that Adam had for his wife. And out of that marital love, they conceived a child. Now, in a similar sense, Paul is telling us here that there are certain individuals that God has loved, foreloved, in eternity that he has determined that he would save, predestined them to become conformed to the image of his son. And by the way, what we're talking about here is not just some abstract idea. You know, it has nothing to do with us. Well, that's an interesting idea, but what difference does it make? Well, the difference it makes is the only reason why you are here this morning and I am here this morning, the only reason we have any love for the Lord at all is because of this choice, this foreloving of God. Remember what John says in his first letter? We love because he first loved us. Well, that's exactly what this is talking about. He loved us beforehand in eternity, and he chose to make us like his son. Second, the Bible tells us, or God tells us in his word, that he made this choice without anything that we would do in view. So not only does this other passage not talk about what God foresees. It's whom He foresees, whom He foreloves. But the Bible actually tells us that God does not make this choice based upon anything He sees in those whom He chooses. And this is what, you know, Calvinists mean by unconditional election. His choice was not conditioned, it was not influenced by anything that He saw in us. Now, Paul tells us that that is exactly what happened when he chose Jacob but rejected Esau. Remember we read in Romans 9, verses 11 through 13, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to His choice would stand, not because of works, not because of what they did, but because of Him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. And then, Paul goes on to say that that principle didn't apply just to Jacob and Esau and God's choice of them or lack of choice, but it applies to everyone whom God chooses. In verses 15 and 16, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs but on God who has mercy. And then that chapter goes on to say, you know, that the potter has the right 
to make from the clay uh, a vessel for honorable use and a vessel for dishonorable use. God can do what He wants with those He has created, particularly because they've all fallen into sin and they all justly deserve His damnation. God can decide to have mercy on some, but if He decides He's going to have mercy on some, He's got to make sure that there is a just payment made so that He can have that mercy on them. And that's the reason He sends Jesus into the world. So, He chose us, He foreloved us in eternity and chose us. It wasn't based upon anything that He foresaw in us doing or believing. Thirdly, He chose us because He wanted to give us to His Son. There's a reason behind this. As a reward for the work of His, rede of his work of redemption, of redeeming us. Remember what Isaiah writes in Isaiah 53, verse 10. If he, that is Jesus, would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. Now, remember earlier we were you know, looking at this passage where Jesus was looking at all these people that were following him because he fed them. And he knew they were there only for the food and not for him. He encouraged himself by saying, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Right? Well, what's he talking about? Who are these people the Father's given to him? Well, it's those referred to in Isaiah. Those he would receive as the reward for his work. Now, these people who were following Jesus might have been following him for the wrong reasons. They just wanted food. But Jesus is saying there will be those who will come to him with the right motives. By the way, you know how that um, chapter 6 of John ends. Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no life in you. And then they said, well, how can this man give us his flesh and blood to eat and drink? And they didn't understand it. And he says, you know, does this cause you to stumble? What if the Son of Man should ascend to where he was before? And all the people left. They left. You know, we think about effective evangelism as you, you preach a message and people come. But Jesus spoke some pretty hard truths and he didn't even bother to explain them. He just knew that if there was anyone there that was his, that they would stay. And how do we know that? Because he turned to his 12 and he says, you don't want to go away also, do you? And then Peter says, Lord, to whom else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And then he goes on to say, we believe that you are the one that God has sent. And then Jesus said this, have I not chosen you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? So this idea of choice, why did they stay and the rest left? It's because of choice. God made a choice to give these to him except for Judas, okay? And Jesus knew that there would be others who would come to him. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And then he goes on to say, the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. If you come to Jesus, he will not turn you away. Now, fourthly, the Father brings these that he's chosen to Jesus by giving them his Holy Spirit. That's how he brought us to him. He gave us our, his Spirit to open our eyes to the kingdom. And that's what Jesus means when he says to Nicodemus in John 3, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus goes on to say that the Spirit of God is like the wind who breathes where he wills. You, you hear the sound of it, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Not everybody is born of the Spirit, but those who are see the kingdom of heaven in Christ and they come to him. Now, fifthly, the Spirit gives us the ability to hear Jesus and follow him. Jesus says in John 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, okay? These sheep are the ones that the Father has given to Jesus, the ones who will come to him. He talks about gathering all these sheep into one fold. And then Jesus also finally makes an interesting comment to those Jews from Jerusalem who would not believe, and he tells them they do not believe because they are not of the sheep. The sheep being those the Father has chosen to give Jesus, those who will come, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me, and so forth. 
He says this to those Jews who resisted him, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Okay, if you were of my sheep, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. You're not listening to me and you're not following me. That means you're not of my sheep. And that's the reason you don't believe, you see. It, it, it basically puts God at the forefront as the one who makes the choice because if God had chosen you to be one of his sheep, you would believe. So the point is this. God did not look down the quarters of time in eternity. See that we, with the help of his Holy Spirit, would believe that we would work diligently to put off our sins and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and become holy in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we, by His grace, would persevere to the end and then say, oh, that's the one I want. I want the one who's going to make it to the end. I don't want the rest of those people that fall away because if the Lord had looked ahead at all of us, He would have seen everybody fail and everybody would have ended up basically in, in hell. Okay, that's not what happens, He chose us in eternity to give us the Holy Spirit so that we would believe and by His grace become holy and would persevere to the end and be saved. And again, this is the, the reason for that meditation at the very beginning. Paul writes in Ephesians 1 verse 4, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. It's His choice that makes us holy and blameless. It's not our choosing Him becoming holy and blameless that makes Him choose us. Do you see the difference between those two views? God does the choosing. Now, there's still you know, so much we need to look at, and we're going to have to do that, of course, next week. But this morning, let's again remember that this is what it means to be saved by grace through faith alone. I hope we all understand that. We are all saved by the grace of God alone. By the way, remonstrants believe that. Roman Catholics believe that. You know, I think, um, well, there, every, every evangelical believes we're saved uh, by, by grace alone, or at least they think they do. But the question is, are we saved by faith alone? Do we receive that grace by trusting in Jesus alone. This is the only view that actually protects that because when you think about the remonstrance view, God looks down and He says, okay, the Holy Spirit gives you help. And then you've got to trust in Jesus. There's something for you to do. You've got to trust in Him and then you have to hold on to Him. Then you have to put off your sins. Then you have to put on Christ and you have to make it all the way to the end. Sounds to me like there's a lot of work for you to do in that view. The same thing with Rome. You know, Rome believes you have to receive grace through the sacrament and you have to cooperate with that grace and do work and you have to keep getting more grace and as you work and become better and better, eventually God will declare you to be righteous and He will justify you. Most people don't make it, so they have to go to purgatory for a billion years or so, but they eventually make it to heaven if, if they have at least some grace. Well, that, there's a lot of works involved in that. But you see, for salvation to be by grace through faith alone, there can't be any of our works when it comes to our salvation, our justification. It has to be purely the work of God. So how does this make it purely the work of God? Well, it ensures us that we're saved only by what Jesus Christ has done. And we are enabled to believe only because God gives us His Holy Spirit to enable us to believe. And our believing is not a righteous act by which God credits us righteousness and declares us to be righteous. But our trusting in Jesus is receiving Him and all of His righteousness and His forgiveness. And that reception of Christ is what justifies us because now we are clothed with Jesus, with His perfect obedience. And our sins are taken away by that sacrifice He made on the cross so many years ago. Salvation is from first to last of the Lord. Now, we still, by God's grace, are transformed. We still become more and more like Jesus. We were predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ, Paul says. But that's a work God is doing in us. It, it's a work that takes place after He gives us the Holy Spirit, after we are justified, after we are saved. 
that work immediately begins where the Spirit of God works from within to make us more like Jesus. So yes, we will obey Him. Yes, we will do all of these things, but our salvation, our justification, our entrance into heaven does not depend on those things that we do. Those are simply the evidences that we belong to Him. I hope all that makes sense. It, we've been building towards this climax for quite some time, so I'm trying to get, get some review and fit all of this in. But the point is, this is God's work alone, and so we really do need to give Him all the glory. Our salvation is all of Him and none of us. The only reason that we believe and that we are growing in holiness and will persevere to the end is because of His electing grace, His grace which He chose to give to us in, you know, from all eternity. So He deserves all the glory. We just need to make sure we give it to Him, give Him the credit, and not take any of it for ourselves. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and um, then we'll prepare to come to the, uh, to the table this morning.